So thank you for joining us today to hear John Forrester uh, give a talk. So he's the Werribee River Association Executive Officer and also the Werribee River Keeper. John will talk about how the Werribee River Association works with community, industry and government to benefit our waterways, wildlife and public health out in the West. So John was appointed as a Werribee Riverkeeper in 2013 after being a member of the Werribee River Association since 1993. His role as a Werribee Riverkeeper is to champion the Werribee River and this means speaking up for the river itself using action, advocacy and education to raise people's awareness and the needs of the river. And so John has a vast knowledge of the Werribee catchment and its flora and fauna. So it's great to have him able to speak with us today as part of the Expert Connections series. And I'll hand over to John now. Thank you, thank you Teresa. And uh, thank you very much to Melbourne Water for giving us here in Werribee the chance to show our wares, so to speak. Uh, so I'm going to share with you today a, a presentation on a PowerPoint. So just give me a moment while I get that up. So the presentation today is about investing in Melbourne's Western Waterways. Uh, we'll run through quite a few things here. Uh, this picture, by the way, is from one of the Melbourne Water and Werribee River Association activities uh, in Werribee called Mad About Platypus, uh, whereby, as you can see, some of the kids and the adults had a look at some invertebrates. Great day, great weather. Uh, last summer, one of the last COVID uh, things we could do prior to COVID. But I too want to acknowledge our traditional owners, uh, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land of which I'm speaking, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging wherever we all are today. So the format of today's webinar looks like this. It gives a snapshot of Western Waterways plants, birds and platypus, and it introduces you to the term Western Plains, we'll speak about that, or a video will in a few moments. We talk about adaptation by the River Association itself as an organisation to meet external changes thrust on it by changes in the catchment. We talk about multi-benefit investments in waterways. We discuss a business as usual approach, some plans awaiting investment, and who else should be in the mix. So, what I'm now going to show you is a video of some of the uh, features in, uh, first of all, some plants. Then uh, there'll be a couple of minutes of some local birds. And then we'll look at the story of how the Werribee River Association has been working with platypus over the years. So investing in Melbourne's waterways, a snapshot of plants, birds and platypus. So Western Plains grassland plants, just the common names uh, so that uh, I won't misspell all the, all the scientific ones. So blue devils, beautiful little spiky things. They're even bluer than that. Uh, break of day, daisies really lovely in your garden. These two are the chamomile sunray, really lovely things. So you can find these all throughout the West. Uh, noon flower, so as its name says, opens in the brightest parts of the day. Uh, Austral indigo or indigofera. And here's a bit of reading for you. So you can see in the background there, some of the buttercups, billy buttons and other things, so volcanic rocks because the plains are Plains because they filled up all the hollows and bumps with lava flows millions of years ago and the plants have adapted and love it with all the uh, ephemeral swamps and, and um, hollows filled with water in the season. Plants just adore it. Uh, getting back to a few more plants, uh, obviously kangaroo apples, we're all, all familiar with that. Here's the uh, Pelagonium uh, of the local area. These beautiful beetles doing their thing on the showy Podolepus and the possum tails, sometimes called pussy tails as well. 
And here's the ruby saltbush fruit. And finally, the desert cassia or senna as we might know it. So here we're getting into a couple of bushland birds and these two were the parents of a couple of young ones I watched uh, hatch. So they're just about to start breeding and I watched them one summer until the babies were raised. This fellow's sitting down and getting a bit tired. He'll do something shortly to let you know. There we are, just like all of us from time to time. Now this little one's a quickie just like they are in real life. This one's right outside my gut, my house, outside my study, right where I'm talking now. So grow yourself a nice habitat garden and you never know what might turn up. These fellows are down at the Werribee treatment plant, uh, the Western treatment plant, and uh, we're just standing by the roadside one day, hence the shaky video as I put it out the car. Uh, Australasian pipits, which are now returning to the area because of the summer, ready to feast on the insects and so on up there. Now this one tells you why he's called what he is. He'll take off in a moment with his dead mouse that he's just enjoying. So you can certainly see why he's called a black-shouldered kite. And here we are over on Hobble, Hobbles Creek in Lara on a wet day. Perfect for going out to visiting, uh, going out looking for things like crakes and others. And now we're into some migratory birds. Now these birds have lost about 60 to 70% of their volume or quantity of numbers, not just this wood sandpiper, but the migratory birds that visit us from the East Asia Flyway. And here are two on our final shot, brolgas down by the beach at Werribee Treatment Plant. So they're having a nice holiday. And finally, our section of the video talks about the platypus work we've done, starting off with Australian Platypus Conservancy in 1998. Jeff Williams here showing a platypus to Dorothy. Uh, they were allowed in those days to be shown like that, but now they have to return to the water much more quickly uh, if netted. But here I take you to Hillsville to see what their tank shows us in the way they swim with their front legs. You'll notice that their back legs are pretty, pretty still and their beak, their bill moves. Now, all of that is good information when you see this next picture. You can see that the rubber band is a nice thing or a hair tie will easily go up over the bill. And this fellow was found dead, killed by a cat, but now he's done an excellent job for the last 10 years or so with us. Now, here we have uh, Josh Griffiths and Tom with him from Caesar Australia back in about 2015 pulling a live platypus out of their, their net, checking it, you'll see in a moment, for litter scars. You'll watch uh, Josh on the left, checking for litter. They then take that up to the back of the truck and uh, remove any litter, which we did that particular night, took a rubber band off that one. And uh, this is Tom to, to checking for microchips from previous surveys. But it costs a lot to get people out to put nets in the river and so forth. So it's easier now to take DNA samples from water out of the river. And that water has to be pushed through a filter, the filter taken away, dispatched to the lab, who give us a report then on the likelihood of DNA. Sorry, oh, yes, DNA of platypus in the river. And these two little short videos uh, just here, just near that mad about platypus site I showed you earlier on in the presentation. Unfortunately, in 2018, we lost seven platypus to a hoot net in one net, a tragic loss in Werribee. Fortunately, though, that assisted us get this alliance uh, to get a statewide ban on those enclosed nets. And this one, this photo was taken just a couple of weeks ago on the Werribee River in Werribee, just to assure us all that platypus still survive. Now, platypus have just been recommended to be listed as threatened under the Flora and Fora Act uh, here in Victoria. So we hope they've got a good future coming up. So there we are. You've now had an introduction to the Western Plains of Melbourne on which the Werribee catchment is placed. And I'll see if we can get on to the next slide. Good, good, good. So just to go back over, whoops, I beg your pardon.
sorry, it's just trying to get rid of what I can see on the screen there. Just to go over the Western Waterways for you, you can see that uh, prior, and imagine that prior to, prior to 2005, this whole area of the Werribee catchment, save a little bit right at the bottom near the green circle, I'll explain the green and red and so forth in a minute, although you might be reading ahead of me. But this whole area of the Werribee catchment had no waterway manager. So that meant prior to 2005, builders and developers were building houses and they had no one who could act as a referral authority. That is, no one to insist on a proper system of drainage uh, and so forth. So there were some worrisome things happening. But councils out this way, municipalities, water authorities and the local community had been clamouring for years for a waterway manager. There was a waterway manager in the Geelong region, of course, the Karangamite CMA was set up. Melbourne had Melbourne water. But this area was in no man's land. This area and half of the Maribyrnong catchment. So if you look across to Sunbury, you can see it just slightly to the right of the map. Uh, Sunbury itself was also not in a Uh, a waterway managers. So the top half of the Maribyrnong and all of the Werribee became under the control of Melbourne Waters boundaries in 2005 and that was a blessing and so we're very pleased with that. Now just to return to the map, so the reservoirs of our rivers are marked there in the red circles and the main ones in the Werribee are the Pikes Creek Reservoir, so there's a diversion we're off the Werribee that sends water across to the reservoir itself. If you go across to the Lurderderg River, you could see a, a little grey uh, blob, and that's also a diversion we're sending water across to Merrimoo Reservoir via a couple of tunnels and another creek. And down at Melton, you can see the long length of the Werribee River there, just a few kilometres actually, it, is. it stretches out quite a long way back when the reservoir is full. Uh, also blocked off by, in their, in their case, a, a dam wall or a weir wall. And then down in Werribee, there's a diversion weir, and that's what the picture is to your left. So that's the diversion weir in Werribee. When, when the Melton Reservoir has water released out of it for irrigation, they send the water down the channel of the Werribee River to the diversion weir from where it's sent at in channels and now pipes. So quite a lot of it is piped out now to the farms down in the green circle area and the diversion weir acts as a stoppage for all the normal flows. So you can see by that that the rivers, including parts of the Maribyrnong, are very highly regulated and uh, don't have normal flows. And in particular, the Werribee has only about 10% of its flow ever reaches the sea. I always liken it to that story out of the Colorado River in the United States, which they say doesn't reach the sea. I have seen the Colorado and the Grand Canyon, but I haven't followed it all the way to the sea. But I do know from my colleagues in water keeping over there that they do suffer the same problem. Although we are much smaller than the Colorado, still the same thing persists, that there's a lot of regulation, a lot of the water used for good purpose, but it stops the natural flow and the natural, um, natural being, the living entity part of the river. So you can see on the Division Weir photo that there's a slight flow going over the top of the weir wall. So that might be after some rain when the river gets a lot more rain than uh, the, the weirs might cope with. So they can send some of it over the weir wall or an environmental flow may be given by Melbourne Water and the Victorian Environmental Water Holder and that might flow over the wall and then on down to keep the platypus nice and fresh or the give a signal to the fish to breed and so forth. So uh, the weir wall is pretty important in terms of the culture of Werribee. It's been known for a long time and the irrigation farming has been a wonderful big industry for the area, but there are side effects and that is that the river is sometimes badly affected. So I think we've just about covered all the information on that. Just before we leave the map, just glance your eyes back to it again. The Western Plains I was talking about in the video just before really are from anywhere from Port Phillip Bay and Melbourne right up to about Sunbury 
and right westwards, all the way through Mount Edgerton, Little Earl Reservoir. And in fact, it goes right across to Mount Gambier, as many of you will know, as the Great Victorian Volcanic Plain. And so the flatlands are below, say, Bacchus Marsh, between Bacchus Marsh and Werribee, and beyond Bacchus Marsh, going up to the north of the map, are the central highlands. And it's in there, in those highlands, that you have the central west forests. Uh, you'll hear a bit about that later on. I quote that as a submission we put in uh, some thoughts on some time back. And of course, there's calls for things like national parks and whatever up that way so that our headwaters can be kept uh, in good condition and also so that biodiversity can survive up there and so that we, the likes of us living in these ever-growing urban areas, can get up there and uh, recreate and so forth. So I think that's probably all about that. So we'll move on. I wanted to show you this graph. Uh, this talks about changes in the Werribee River over time. Um, we're just going to pick on the, the fish line. Now this is, graph is made up from limited amount of data. It's a subjective graph, if the mathematicians amongst us will forgive me. But we based uh, this uh, scale Poor is naught, very good is six on Melbourne Waters Water Quality Index, which you can find on the website under, I think it's entitled something like Yarra and Port Phillip Bay Water Quality or similar. If you get into the Melbourne Water site and punch in those sorts of words, you'll probably find that. Uh, perhaps Richard might find a link to it and put it on the chat room or somewhere for you. So we based our blue line on their information. So in uh, 1998 or thereabouts, it was considered fair. So that's what the three means. Uh, after that, during the millennial drought, it, it did deteriorate. So Melbourne Water acknowledged that. So we called that line, uh, line two. So across until about the end of the millennium drought, it stayed that low. Um, uh, then in about 2010, 11, 12, the drought ended and you can see the rise goes up to fair. Sorry, I think I was reading off the wrong line. It's the purple one. So water quality poor, it got a bit better with some rains towards the end of the drought. And then, however, again, it started to go downhill. So that's the overall water quality of the Werribee catchment. The other waterways are very similar. And I do suggest you have a look at that website link. It's, um, it's, it's good to keep up with it. The fish, I'll go back to that's where I started wrongly. The fish line, uh, we based our fair statement for that on number three. Uh, because of the local old timers who said they used to catch blackfish, uh, the, the common name given to a lovely fish that was a good fighting fish and a good eating fish in the Werribee River. Uh, that used to catch that in the heart of the CBD of Werribee up until the 1960s. And now the only place you can find that in the Werribee is right up above Bacchus Marsh. So the fish have got worse and worse. And of course now, uh, and as we've had for 20 or 30 odd years, we have huge carp in the Werribee River. And you can see some of those when you get down close to the water. We have videos and pictures of them up to one meters long, not the video, the fish. Uh, so um, they're, they're a very big presence. And of course they're hurting the habitat by eating different vegetable um, plants and so on, vegetation and plants. So they're impacting badly on a fish in the Werribee River. If we jump up to the platypus numbers in 1998, and that was in the film we talked about before, we found 16 individual animals in those days. That dropped in uh, the years 2002. I think we had about eight in our second netting survey in about 2001-2. And then as the millennium drought uh, showed, um, with water across southeastern Australia, there was a lot less water and the numbers of platypus right across Melbourne and up north into the Sydney area also dropped. And these, then for the next 10 years through 2010 to 2020, the numbers we did find and Melbourne Water found on its platypus netting surveys, and this is being reinforced by the DNA studies they're doing now, which are a little cheaper, we're finding that there are low numbers and uh, we have had very few sightings of platypus over the last few years. So again, the downward trend there is quite evident. And what didn't I mention, litter, the brown line. So we put the brown line at number four because it just, it looked like in our memories in those days, 1998, it wasn't as bad as it is now. So we started there looking at our 
um, knowledge, our own knowledge there, so a really quite a subjective call. Uh, but around about 2000, we had in our history of our record committee meetings, we had a litter subcommittee, it was called. And uh, they had uh, mentioned that they'd been meeting. So we took that to mean that mm, they're starting to get a problem. And then in about four or five years ago, we started our first major litter groups. We'd always been doing keep up, uh, clean up Australia days and so forth. But four or five years ago, we started our litter groups. Beach Patrol 3030 was the first one, and that's affiliated with all beach patrol groups around the bay, and also the Love Our Street groups, of which we have three. So our first group started in about 2015, and the data we've gathered since then is just showing us that litter is becoming more and more of a problem. And we also linked that downward trend line and reaffirmed that it should be a downward trend line by the fact that the first platypus surveys in 1998 showed us that 40% of the platypuses across Melbourne that Jeff Williams of the Australian Platypus Conservancy was catching were 40% affected by litter. So hair bands, rubber bands, a whole lot of things, fishing line and so forth. Some pretty gruesome photos exist uh, by those who are in the platypus community. And that has certainly not got any better uh, just yesterday, I was discussing a litter with a couple of people on Zoom, and we were talking about the prevalence of litter now noticed right across the community. We had 20 people on Zoom chat, uh, and, and there were people from Point Cook and Manor Lakes, so that's the extreme sides east and west of Wyndham, uh, quite some kilometres apart, and they were all saying the same things. And people up in Truganina, which is up to the top, the north, all saying the same thing, that there's a tremendous amount of rubbish around, either dumped out of trailers and trucks or dropped and littered by people who are buying takeaway food and containers. So more of that later. But one other thing that did change was the growth in population. So as all of those downward trends thing happened, you can now see coming on your screen the growth in the city of Werribee or Wyndham, as it was later called and is called now. So it grew from somewhere around the mid, or around 60 or 70,000, and it's now up to just short of 300,000, and it will climb higher over the years. Now, if you think back to that map and you saw Bacchus Marsh further north, Melton and Wyndham, if you join all of those together from 1998 to 2000, uh, sorry, 2020, I should say, that's what the growth of population looks like. So it's a massive increase. And if you just cast your mind back to that map and think about around Werribee now, the city of Werribee on that map would be about the size of a 20 cent piece. Uh, Melton is not far behind it, uh, perhaps a 15 cent piece if you think about that. And Bacchus Marsh probably about a five cent piece. But Bacchus Marsh is also growing. So you can see a massive amount of change in the catchment. And, and we had to change accordingly. So this graph introduces you to change in the Werribee River Association. None of these uh, slides and lines and pictures move. So we're just going to have a look around the outer circle, that is the outer red mark. In 1981, our first meeting, one of the, uh, the esteemed gentlemen who were there said, political pressure may be required. This was quoted in the uh, minutes of the meeting. And it was interesting. I'll come back to that comment in 2014 when we get there. In around about 1995, I mentioned before the municipalities, the water authorities and so on that existed in those days were clamouring for a waterway manager and they clamoured and clamoured and eventually the state government created uh, the Kelp Board, Port Phillip Westport Catchment Kelp Board and uh, then they, out of that, eventually 10 years later came to the fact that Melbourne Water should be out this way as the manager. So we referred to that, so I won't mention that again. We'll go on to 2014. Um, in the 10 years between when Melbourne Water came and 2014, the River Association went through change. The, the urbanisation was increasing, uh, um, administration of the organisation was increasing, what with things like insurance and incorporation and child protection, this and that, and administration of grants and acquittals. I'm sure you all know about that. So in 2014, we did a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats of the organisation and we asked our members for ideas. 
And in this discussion in 2014, somebody said not to get political. Well, we didn't know what to do or answer with that, but we knew we had to become more speaking up for the river. So that's when Theresa mentioned earlier today that part of my role as the river keeper is to speak up for the catchment and the waterways of the West and the Werribee River uh, in particular. So that's where our meaning of political comes from. Uh, 2015, we wrote our first strategic plan. We'll have a look at the second one in a few minutes time. By 2018, after four years of work it took to apply for this, we got our deductible gift recipient status. So we're now eligible to apply for philanthropic uh, grants. And we have been talking to a couple of people on that of late. And uh, in 2019, we released our second strategic plan and we are going to see that in just a moment. So we had quite a few changes as an organisation and it wasn't, hasn't been easy. There's been a lot of work put in. But just to jump to the inner circle, it's also been interesting that in our growth, we originally had a hand-drawn picture of a platypus in a small circle. Uh, still haven't worked out quite who drew that. I've got my suspicions and I'm going to ask about that soon of someone. But we then, by about 2009 or 10, uh, we then had a, a picture of the same platypus done by a local uh, designer on a bit of vinyl. We did a banner and we hung that on uh, the back of a tractor. In fact, we might have had it about 2000 when I think of it, but this photo is from about 2010 of that banner. And as you can see, a few creases in the banner, but we started making the uh, image look a bit better. Around about four or five years later, by 2015 or so, we had that digital version, the brown and the simple circle. And just this last year, we changed to the logo at the top. And so we think it's moved to modern times. The platypus looks a bit happier. And well, we hope that'll be good for us. So there we are. That's our changes in our river association. And here we have just a copy of the front of where it is where every River Association's second strategic plan, uh, where we have a vision of a healthy Werribee River and catchment waterways by 2070. Now you'll hear again that in, uh, later in the presentation about why we chose such a long way out. And um, we'll talk about that a bit later, but it gave us a length of time to achieve some of these things. Uh, they are the long-term things. Our mission though, which we're hoping to achieve much quicker than that, is to create our own place. So we live in a new urban city. It once was a small town. It doesn't have a whole lot of old buildings. And there's such a pressure on the local municipality to create new buildings for childcare and for a whole range of other purposes that we don't have a place to call our own. We have a small office in a shared house with a shoestring gardening, an art group, uh, and a couple of other groups, but we've got nowhere to bring a student school or uh, community groups in to hear our story or join us and do some activity. And uh, we've got nowhere to store our stuff and so on. So we need some support in that matter. And that's what we're working towards. And some good things are happening on that in the background. And we want to, to create our own place to protect and respect our waterways and to love native wildlife and habitat. We envisage such a place as being the home to three or four or five or six interest groups who could share it with us and uh, live out their lives, as it were, in some sort of alliance. And, and that's quite an active, open, transparent wish of the River Association. Um, our medium term objectives in order to get to that longer term look is to offer opportunities for the community to contribute either as ideas or volunteering time or enjoyment or physical exercise. Uh, we want to increase our work in environmental education and awareness. Uh, we'll look at how we've done a bit of that so far. Uh, we want to professionalise Werribee River Association, which we've certainly started doing and we're on the track but there's more to be done. We're building our strategic partnerships. We have around, we did a survey of this, an audit of it rather earlier this year. We have 60 at the moment partnerships. Not all of them are active at once, of course. Some of them have been active once or twice over the years more. Some of them are active practically on a weekly basis with us. And we also want to use science as a method, a way of moving forward 
and you can see straight below science there is a photo of our two first employees underneath our little blitz officer liam on the left and on the right is uh, our first um science officer teresa who happens to be hosting this video from melbourne water at the moment and on the left there we have some of our uniform with our old logos on it so we're slowly using up that old uniform and we're slowly converting it to new uniform with uh, our new logos on it so we're smartening up as it were and on the right just a snapshot of uh, a screenshot rather of a recent meeting we had via zoom just to indicate that we are trying to use it as well in the best way we can we're learning a lot and we're no doubt we've got more to do so some of our active programming so you can see on the left i mentioned liam our little bits officer before uh, we run four little groups i mentioned names earlier beach patrol and love our street uh, love our street groups of course work in the street as it says uh, they're all doing well one of them is love our street 3024 we just started that before COVID hit so we haven't really got any momentum in that one we had two activities and that's all we've been able to do at this stage but we're still doing some work in the background uh, preparing for a relaunch hopefully as soon as we can we've had some in well we do have some individual champions so all of the leaders of those groups are acting autonomously run their own show and uh, we pat them on the back for their passion and the interest and uh, we hope they'll and we know they'll continue and they and we hope they will uh, into time to come uh, we do quite a bit of plast plastics research microplastics and so on in conjunction with uh, port phillip bay keeper and a few others in that regard um, we are also just starting up a conversation with um, conservation conservation volunteers australia on another project and we also run some corporate days if you look just across to the people in orange in the middle there that's wholesome who own a quarry or a couple of quarries in the western edges of Werribee and uh, we work with them on a corporate day for litter work as well as planting so the picture they have is of planting uh, at one of our um, sites but uh, they also do a corporate day and we, we are open to anyone wanting that we've had quite a few corporate days over the last few years we do water quality science I've mentioned a bit of that before but we're looking at nutrients with Monash Uni uh, we are looking at pollution mapping ourselves under a Port Phillip Bay fund grant uh, looking at metal sorry mapping metal pollution in the Werribee and in Skeleton Creek here in Wyndham uh, we run a couple of friends of groups at uh, Werribee River Park which is a Park Victoria property and out of Cobbledix Ford Reserve which is a city of Wyndham property and uh, we do quite a bit of litter cleanup planting weeding those sorts of things there plus we run uh, bird surveys at uh, Werribee River Park so that's part of our surveys let's jump down to the bottom we do research there in bird surveys. We are also the group who brought the Eucalyptus Bariana thalassina or Werribee Blue Box to the attention of the herbarium earlier this century. So around about the 2006, seven mark, uh, we started looking at that tree saying that, well, there'd been often discussion about it being a bit different. So we gave it to the herbarium. And a few years later, they declared it to be known as the Werribee Blue Box. And for you scientific people, I understand this DNA discussion on whether that's actually a member of the eucalypt family or not but no matter whatever they decide they have said to us they will still call it the common name wherever blue box about which we're happy so it's a tree that grows on the lurdaderg river and the werribee river and in two or three spots around it doesn't really like right down on the water like say river red comes it grows up on say the first step up from uh, the, the flood zones um, we a few partnerships have talked about some of those before and platypus we've talked about that so uh, we're very active and that of course helps us keep a lot of volunteers underway Richard do you want to have that break or are we wish to keep going uh, we've just got one question so far so someone was mentioning the 2018 platypus depth, uh, the death they'd remembered, um, and they were asking if the person that did it had been caught, so that entanglement in a uh, net. I'd like to say yes, Richard, but of course the answer is um, no, uh, not that we know. So, of course, we don't do the investigation. We work with Wildlife Victoria, who did all that. Uh, sorry, Fisheries and Wildlife, I should say. and uh, they 
don't tell you what happens because, of course, they're subject to um, mm. other regulations. But, however, they did investigate quite thoroughly. Uh, so we have no idea who did it ourselves. So, no. And I might just mention for anyone that does come across those uh, Opera House nets um, out in along their waterways, uh, the best organisation to get in touch with that is the Victorian Fisheries Association uh, Authority. Sorry, and I'll put a link into the chat for that as well. Um, so that's it for our questions so far. But um, if anyone does have any questions throughout the rest of this presentation, just type them into the chat or the Q and A function, and I'll keep an eye out. We've got one more that just popped up, um, and somebody's. In interested in getting involved in environmental education and after a bit of contact info. So I might plug in a bit of um, the Weeby River Association's contacts on the webpage into the chat as well. Yeah, cheers, Richard. We'll also have that on the screen on the last slide as well. And uh, we've got an active Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter, and uh, what else have we got? I think that's about all for the purposes now. And of course, a nice website as well. So if you Google Weeby River, association or wherever you river keeper you're bound to come up with some contact all right shall i move on yep yep let's keep going okay so we're now going to um just have a quick look at not too much don't worry about the writing there aren't a lot of screens like this one but i just wanted to point out to you the benefits of a community group doing active things so we did an audit of our group and uh, we looked at the last um, 39 years which this group has been involved and we put together the committee, the board, the forums, the meeting hours and we multiplied that by the, the people involved, the sessions we had and over the years at $50 an hour. Now we consider $50 an hour to be a fair rating for this because the people who take part in these things are skilled people and they have some good talents and passion and so rather than the standard $30 an hour, which is quoted, we believe the work is worth $50 an hour. And in fact, I know in the last census it was recommended or discussed, at least they would lift that 30 to $34. So I'm not sure how that's faring throughout the, um, the granting world, but we're just going to base our work on $50 an hour uh, because particularly in the last 20 years, if you look at uh, inputs number four, the administration we just did for the last 20 years, it's been very evident since 20 or 2000, I should say, or uh, that the, the amount of administration is increasing and its complexity is growing. So we added up all the time multiplied by all those factors and we come up with two and a half million dollars worth of work. So that's what it's taken to run this organisation for the last few years. So if we had a, an officer who was our administration person who organised all this, um, perhaps we could pay them a reasonable salary. What, so anyway, that's what that's worth, just in our time alone, a contribution to the community and the biodiversity and the wildlife and amenity and so forth of the Werribee River and the catchment and the waterways. Um, now, just to give you an idea of that, if you jump across to River Recovery Incorporated, so this operated in the two or three years around 98 to 2001 or thereabouts. This was a project in the heart of Werribee in the CBD, an area of the river which had box thorn, a lot of litter and rubbish, some, a lot of inaccessibility uh, issues. People wanted to walk down the main street, then maybe go and have a coffee down on the river. There was just nowhere to go. So this group, which was largely run by us, along with uh, some volunteers and groups from service clubs and so forth, who actually helped out with the work. This was admined and managed by ourselves in partnership with the city. Uh, and uh, it, it just aimed at where we see the improvements. And just to show you how many of our people were involved, this is a meeting in what's called the Old Shire Office. This is a meeting of River Recovery Incorporated, a separate organisation to the Werribee River Association, but set up with ourselves and the city. This room has the three people against the back wall, so Alex, Heather and Gail, uh, and then around, they're our members, and around to the side here, chat closest to us, with the dark here is Kim. He was our treasurer at the time. Um, just one beyond him, a man in the glasses, another Kim. They used to call each other K1 and K2. Uh, he was the treasurer. And moving beyond that, um, we have Glennis, whose hair only, the dark hair is uh, alive, and then Terry, whose head is bent forward. Uh, they are all Werribee River Association members. So we pitched into that river recovery uh, organisation, which put about $2 million worth of work in 1998 to 2000, so considerable money, money raised through grants and the contribution of City Wyndham into the Werribee River. 
So if you look at the line of the outputs of various projects and so forth, we think that over the years, we've been able to bring into the area four and a half million dollars in grants and so on. And just to give that an up-to-date illustration, we obtained two grants from Port Phillip Bay Fund about three years ago now. They're just pulling to a close in this COVID time, a bit longer than expected, but so is everything else at the minute, of about 300,000 or 350,000, around that much. So it goes to show these things do add up. And then all the rest of it there, the millions and millions. Um, our own work, we figure the research, the water quality, revegetation, litter and so forth, worth a couple of million dollars. These are estimates only, but the Melbourne Water Waterway Manager role came out this way. They put um, a lot of planning in place. When I was working in Bacchus Marsh in Grow West, at the time a landscape change project a few years ago, back at the start of uh, 2007, 8, 9, perhaps up to 2010, um, the Melbourne Water were out this way, taking um, shots of the Werribee River videos. They were looking at the river itself, con judging its condition. This is when they're coming in to take over. They remember they had their area expanded, never been here before. Uh, they were doing mapping exercises. They were liaising with local municipalities and Department of Primary Industries, as it was called in those days up in Bacchus Marsh. So they put a lot of work into that. So we figured since that time, uh, in those um, 15 years, they would have spent at least a million dollars on salary and planning and so forth out this way. And then in about 2013, they came up with the Healthy Waterways Strategy. And again, just an estimate. So we reckoned in the last seven, eight, years they've spent about 10 million dollars on projects as soon as melbourne water were announced as the waterway manager out this way they announced a few projects and one here in Werribee was worth three hundred thousand dollars so straight away you can hear that each year it would be easy for them to spend a million dollars and so we just put those estimates in and all those other things that we have contributed to and there's a list the epa review and closed net band waterways in the west and we'll hear about that a bit more later waterway blitz and the container deposit scheme, they're all yet to be determined the benefits of those things. And yet the Werribee River Association was very active and being a good partner with many, many others to get these things brought to pass. So we're looking forward to those. So in 10, 20 years, someone might review the work of the Werribee River Association and say it's worth a lot, lot more than that. So um, we'll move on to the next slide. Here's one of the big things in which we've taken part in over the last possibly five to seven years really. So a few years ago Melbourne Water decided to review their healthy waterway strategy and they called their review a co-designed uh, review. So they brought the community in, I think they were very brave and they're to be congratulated for that. They asked the community what the community wanted so they looked at the values the community has of its waterways. And they laid out a program of works for each of the major catchments in uh, the Western waterway section of Melbourne. So the, Mar the Werribee has one, the Maribyrnong has a book that looks like this. And so too does the Yarra, the Dandenong and Western Port areas. So in the forward to this catchment for Werribee, the Werribee, sorry, in this book for uh, a program of works for Werribee, they state that climate change is a major threat. Now we would all know that, but it's written clearly in this book. They would say that, or they do say, that business as usual policy and levels of investment are not going to be enough. So they have spent, uh, I've got a little chart here which I picked up from the, where, the Melbourne Water um, site on funding of waterways, flood and drainage services, so this was in July 2016 to July 2021. Over the next five years, they were going to spend, so that's the five years just about to finish, $1 billion on the whole of Melbourne, three and a half hundred, so 348 million on waterway health and amenity, 208 million on stormwater quality and quantity, and 500 million on reducing flood risk. So if you've ever been in South Melbourne and seen those bridges and those intersections flooded with water when we get a heavy summer rainfall, then you'll know that there's a lot of money in trying to get water out of the place. So all of those things are very important. And Melbourne Water has a lot of things to spend money on, a lot of responsibility. And if they're going to be given um, money, 
to spend on things into the future, they're not going to be able to meet the challenges of things like climate change, uh, loss of biodiversity, growing community expectations, rising urbanisation with the demand for open space, pleasant places for children and adults to play and recreate and so forth. Business as usual is just not going to do the answer. It's not going to give us the answer. What it does need, and this is straight out of the book too, is that collective action is needed by state government, state regulators, including people like VCAT and others, EPA, local government and other land managers, development sector, and I'll tell you a story about a couple of them in a minute, uh, some landholders, the traditional owners, of course, and ourselves, the community groups, were all going to be needed. So it's a big job in front of Melbourne Water, and it's a big job in front of the community, and it can't be answered just by community groups who give of their own values and their passions and lay out their energy and time and, and everything they've got, and they just see a deteriorating situation around them. We need some good direction from government, and we need some contributions from a wider range of people and organisations, of course. So here's one uh, active um, thing in which the Werribee River Association took part. And just the story attached to this is on the left, the Yarra River Action Plan. So that in fact came out of community advocacy at the end of the 1990s and into the 2000s. Ian Penrose, who was the Yarra River Keeper at the time, uh, managed to visit just about every politician in the Yarra catchment, a massive job. And eventually he got a bipartisan approach to the fact that the Yarra River needed some organisation, some better planning, some better consideration for the ordinary person and so forth. And as a result, by somewhere around about 2010, 12, the Yarra River Action Plan was drawn up. And in that is mentioned that the Yarra River Action Plan, declaring the Werribee River uh, with some plan to be planned by the traditional owners, and to be declared, the river to be, to be declared as a living entity, actually had mentioned the Maribyrnong and the Werribee rivers as in need of some work. So we took up, along with Environment Justice Australia at their behest, we took up a, a, an alliance. We joined an alliance with the Friends of Maribyrnong and the Friends of Steel Creek and Environment Justice Australia and the Werribee River Association. And we put together a program we called Rivers of the West. And what we were trying to do is drag out of the Yarra River Action Plan those, those recommendations, those initiatives which would apply out west. And so uh, Bruce of EGA created this Stepping Stones booklet in front of you, or actually it was a presentation. Uh, and it was in the fine print there, a new generation of river law was needed for the Western waterways and that program along with our many deputations uh, our many discussions submissions conversations and so on led to the minister for water and the minister for planning lisa neville water richard Wynn planning joint announcement called waterways of the west which in fact did honor the commitments in the Yarra river action plan towards the looking at the maribyrnong and the werribee rivers and over 2018, 2000, late seven, 2017, late 2017, 2018, and into 2019, well, um, we ran a program called Waterways of the West. Now, the Werribee River Association did an educational vision with kids from schools, and we, across both catchments, the Maralong and the Werribee, we developed the vision which we presented at the Melbourne Water Kids Teaching Kids Conference at Melbourne University last uh, October-ish in 2019 and the kids wanted the same as anybody else clean water fresh air healthy soil they wanted wildlife places to play places to enjoy no litter and so on so just exactly what the adults wanted and these weren't just kids these were uh, students from primary school late primary were all the way through to hsc or year 12 and so we got a good educational vision there and that was presented um, at a public forum also to uh, some 40 or 50 representatives of both catchments, the Werribee and the Maribyrnong, and uh, accepted and they, that 
that forum of those people put together much of the work that's in Waterways of the West discussion paper, uh, or at least the recommendations of that anyway. And uh, the, the book itself was put together by some great people at DELP, Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, and a few others. And the discussion paper was terrific. The recommendations look good. And hopefully we're expecting a response in late 2020. Now, coronavirus notwithstanding, we're still expecting it about there. And it's going to cover a whole range of things such as better planning, uh, law that is, uh, regulations, uh, building practices, open space requirements, water quality, habit, uh, habitat and so forth. So all of those sorts of things. And again, it emphasises the vital role that the traditional owners will play in it. So we're looking forward to the whole thing at the end with great, um, great expectation. Now, Richard, do you want to take another break or you're pretty right or no, I think I'm jumping in early. So I'll keep going, shall I? Sure thing. I'll keep going. So uh, many years ago, or feels like it now, in 2009, 10, 11, around then, I was invited to take part in what was a terrific innovation at the time, Werribee River Biolink Action Plan. So there was a desktop report done on what was existing out on the Werribee River and uh, some of the neighbouring waterways as to what initiatives were happening, what the state of the, the riparian strip was and so forth. All, all the good points about the idea of making a biolink out this way. So there was research, sorry, there was a, a review of papers, research and so on. And then eventually um, you can see there that there's a Werribee River Biolink Bio Action Plan, Volume 1, Volume 2 being the desktop report. The, the action plan was actually made. Now I sat through that process, it took quite a lot of work. We had quite some beautiful visits to areas of the Werribee River that I hadn't seen before, such as the confluence between the Werribee and the Lurdadu, which not many people do see and it was thanks to the McDonald family that uh, we got in there. I'd met them earlier in the uh, catchment, uh, sorry, yes, ca uh, catchment and land protection board meetings on the Grow West meeting. So that was very handy. Uh, and so the whole of the Werribee River was reviewed with regard to urbanisation and biodiversity and, and habitat and what um, migrant routes for birds could be and where, where plants and animals could be helped and how platypus might survive longer and so forth. It's a great plan and it could be, this particular regional biolink plan could be the driver for financing by a whole range of other organisations. So it could be human health, could be the health department to lift uh, human health outcomes. It could be Department of Environment for biodiversity enhancement, but it could also be Commonwealth government. It could be also uh, philanthropics or even businesses. There's a great example of Toyota on the, with the friends of Lower Kuroi Creek. I think Jeff of the Kuroi Creek group was telling me one time that Toyota had given, not just him of course, but the restoration on the Kuroi Creek, literally millions of dollars. When the Toyota factory in Altona closed down, I think they left the municipality with quite a few million dollars to do pathing and uh, other improvements, art projects, revegetation and so on as a sort of a, a going away gift. Now there are a lot of industries in the west of Melbourne and they've been here for a long time um, and taken advantage of the location and the people. And what we need is for a whole of society, a whole of community input into these initiatives. And this plan needs to be dusted off and come down off the shelf and to be put down on the ground and someone needs to be appointed and someone needs to be funded to get this thing going for the benefits of biodiversity and human health on the Werribee River. And uh, Waterways of the West could, of course, provide one opportunity if the ministers agree to fund it. Uh, and if they say, for example, appoint a team and, uh, um, and uh, employ a person or a couple of people to run the project over, say, a five to 10 year period, then the municipalities would be helped. Perhaps the municipalities themselves could contribute. Uh, that would be a fantastic thing to do. There's wonderful research therefore could be done so the universities could pitch in and appoint some of their PhDs to 
uh, maybe even plan it or set it up or conduct research on the way. There's such a lot of outcomes for this and the community would benefit a uh, hundredfold. So I'm now moving on to a couple of areas of um, the investment and uh, what it leads to. Um, so we know we're going through this coronavirus period whereby uh, mental health is a big issue. And we know that depression is a big factor in the community anyway, prior to coronavirus. And we know that loneliness and uh, disconnectedness is a, is a fact of human life in this modern urban day. And so investment in nature will give you better adults. They'll be better healthier, uh, mentally, are we better physically? Because there'll be places to walk if these places are set up. Um, but we need to do it not in the traditional ways of mown grass and concrete footpaths. We need to do it in ways in which, uh, because older Victorians are more connected to nature than younger members. Now, this is a finding from the Biodiversity 2037 uh, Victorians Value Nature Report by the Department of Environment here in Victoria. We know that's a fact. And they're the very people who need that connectedness and the mental health uh, relaxation and the lowering of stress and so forth. So these, these experiences people have in the bush are um, profound, as the quote is telling us there by Jackson, who did a research topic on this matter uh, back in 2017. So these experiences are very helpful for the community as a whole. And uh, they are very, very important and much needed. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge Melinda Kennedy there on the right in the padded jacket. It was a cold day, that one. Um, don't blame her for wearing the coat. But Melinda Kennedy is from Wadawurrung, and uh, she's been with us a couple of times now, and we've been pleased to work with her on a couple of uh, smoking ceremonies and nature walks and so forth. So good to acknowledge her. It's interesting to note that same Biodiversity 2037 survey uh, noted that women were more connected to nature than men. Well, I think I knew that anyway, but it's wonderful to know that uh, we had therefore a great capacity of audience out in the community to whom we might um, target to come and join groups like ours. And, uh, and in fact, that would be good to get those women in leadership positions and so forth, which would be, would be a, a need for the greater society anyway. And you could pitch it to those people, all people above, say, the age of 50, for health, for membership of the, any organisation of which you might be a member, or we could, of course, as the River Association, leadership I've mentioned, but also voluntary work in the environmental space. Uh, you could do it to those who want to enjoy and want unmodified space, because most people also want unmodified space than they do regulated space. And so this, of course, would suit biodiversity. So that simple Biodiversity 2037 report has quite a lot of good implications in it for the wider community and particularly for our work into the future. Uh, very, very important. But not only is it important for adults, but it's much better for children. So um, the scholastic organisation who are great producers of books, uh, but also do quite a lot of research and so on for children, um, look at the loss of children's play with the natural world impacting their growth and development of the whole child. So my background is in school teaching and of course I'm a parent now grandparent and I see a lot of this happening in kids. They just love the outdoors but if we allow them to become encaptured by the square screen, uh, the, the, the television or the computer, then we allow them the chance to develop empathy and care for living things and connectedness with another person's enjoyment of the outdoors. But the final point in that quote is for the continuing loss of the natural environment. So we need to connect these people, these young ones, excuse me, voice caught a bit there. We need to connect these young people with the natural environment in an uh, unregulated space so they can enjoy those things, develop those emotions, increase their, um, emotional intelligence, make them, allow them to take risks and enable them to become a better individual human being. And that will help families in society. We've got a few issues around that area of uh, the community and they will also be better at school 
they will also be better independent thinkers and they'll arrive at a maturational stage a lot earlier than some other children. So there's quite a lot to get out of investment in mother nature. Now, interestingly, that very photo is taken on the lovely rock area of the Werribee River, almost or a bit north of the Werribee centre uh, CBD. But just outside the other side of those trees is a large mown grass area. You can see the houses on the hill perhaps, but there would be between the Werribee CBD and the diversion where which we saw earlier, probably about 30 hectares of land to 40 hectares of land, which is just mown grass. And in places it's 100 metres wide. It's allowing the land to dry out. It's increasing the edge effects, uh, that is the warmth and drying, that impacts on the riparian strip, which is thin enough already. So it dries it out and enables hot air to go through that bushy stage. And there are concrete footpaths running along through the grassed areas. And those grass, sorry, those footpaths have no shade on them. And they reach 55 degrees on those hot days. When there's a temperature of somewhere between 38 and 44 or 45 degrees, we have measured these, we've laid temp, um, thermometers on the ground. The thermometer will reach 55 degrees after about 20 to 25 minutes in the sun because of the warmth that's in the concrete beneath and the heat of the afternoon sun. And then that heat will stay there till two and three o'clock in the morning. So of an evening when the town is trying to cool down and everybody's trying to go to sleep, the concrete is still keeping them hot. And that's increasing the edge effects on the riparian strip in those same studies, we also incidentally went into the shady areas you can see behind the two boys, and the, degree, the temperature was seven and eight degrees cooler in the shade. So we could put along our pathways some shading, not such a big exercise, but it's awfully hard to change mowing regimes, when it's what they've done for year after year after year, a business as usual approach. We need people in planning, and maintenance, it doesn't matter whether it's one municipality or the other, it happens everywhere. We need to change the way in which we shape the world in which we live. Uh, I'm getting towards uh, the last few slides, so we'll keep going. Um, here I'm going to introduce a topic called rights of nature and don't worry that there's another table here. We've actually seen this one before, but I'm just going to use it. It's a little different shape, a little different coloured. I'll refer to what I'm going to use it for as we move into it. Over on the left hand side, I rediscovered in a book I've been reading, the David uh, Boyd, um, the rights of nature book. So Yarra Riverkeeper, Andrew and I read a book each by the same title and we swapped. One's about the history of the ethics of environmentalism and the other ones about um, how a legal revolution is sweeping the world with regard to the rights of nature. So a river in New Zealand, for example, was given a living entity status. The Yarra River now has the same, almost the same status under a different legal system. New Zealand's a bit different to us, but they're now being recognized, these significant places, and there are many examples across the world as living entities. When this, proposal for something like that to become a living entity arose, people were ridiculed. Then there was heavy discussion. Remember the discussion about how maybe those people who might be listening today were called greenies, didn't know what the real world was like, get out and get a job, all that sort of thing. Well, that was this whole thing again, ridicule, and then some discussion. And finally, though, things are being adopted. So that river in New Zealand is now a living entity. It has legal rights. It's like a person. No one's allowed to harm it, etc., etc. And that's what's happening here in Australia. And it's slowly being accepted. Well, I just want to point out that uh, John Stuart Mill, who said that ridicule discussion and adoption quote there, um, was then talked about by David Boyd, who said the rights of nature are advancing rapidly through those stages. And if you have a look at the table, we've got their contribution when and the outputs. You can see the contribution by the Werribee River associated into these various initiatives, the EPA review, which we mentioned earlier. And you can see that's advocacy. Then we've formed an alliance for the NETS and we collaborated in the waterways of the West and the partnership for the container deposit scheme. So we joined with Boomerang Alliance and a whole range of others. 
and we pushed the container deposit scheme in Victoria, which took a long, long time. It was way, way overdue, but it's coming next year, touch wood. And we'd like uh, people to, um, to take notice of that. And there are some emails hanging around the systems now about Boomerang Alliance wanting us to do something else there. So maybe you can have a look at those as a, an action following our meeting today. But look at the advocacy on the second last line. So the Wherever River Association talked to the City of Wyndham about single-use plastic policies because there were certain festivals happening on certain block of land in Werribee, which was um, leaving a mess behind. So as a result of us doing an audit of all the data, all the uh, litter we found, the types of litter and uh, who dropped it and where it went and how far it spread and what the prevailing winds do with it and where it landed in the river and all that sort of thing, we actually got them with their own significant um, contributions as well, of course, in their own organisation. We got them towards a single-use plastics policy, which they finally adapted for a first change, first stage item in their own facilities and own buildings, which is working successfully, I hear. Uh, they're a big organisation, so they're working it through. And we hope next year they might move into uh, single-use plastics on their public land for the likes of those festivals who rent or hire or use those public spaces. So that's a great thing. Now, if you'd mentioned single-use plastic bands years ago, you might have been laughed out of the court or, or the room in which you were, but it's slowly becoming a normal practice across the world. But waste policy is the same, and the, to the credit of the state government, they're actually going to bring in uh, some waste things next year, and I think coronavirus has slowed them down in that regard as well. But it's on the way and the outputs for those sorts of things are sustainability, save wildlife, amenity of human beings and so forth. And in the submissions also, here's the Central West Forest. Um, I mentioned before, we put in a submission to the Central West Forest to have um, protect the water quality of the Werribee River to uh, ensure biodiversity survived and more. And there's currently investigations into biodiversity and so on. So all of those things give outputs like water quality and protecting biodiversity and more. So you can hear the rights of nature slowly coming through and, uh, and we applaud uh, this movement towards that. And of course, investment could help those things. The municipalities could invest in single use plastic policies. State government could invest in, into things like central west forests and so on. Industry could assist with research projects into biodiversity initiatives. Um, companies could contribute towards groups like ours and uh, support our staff and so on because it's always hard to find money in organisations like our own for uh, such initiatives. Um, my final last couple of slides, uh, this one in particular is a bit of a story. This is a photo of the Werribee River just near my house. Uh, it's um, in a street, uh, walk down off the street through that thin riparian strip off that hot concrete path that I was talking about before and laying out here in front of you is quite a large hole in which we spotted platypus before and at times in the worst condition of the river when the river is warm very hot seas and the river has no flow, it sometimes is covered in a zola. So the whole thing could be just a big, long paddock of a zola. And at one stage in about 2015, there were about eight kilometres of river non-stop filled with a zola, which is that green coverage right over there in the background under the one gum tree that's hanging over the river. Uh, and that's a small fern-like plant. It's about as big as your thumb. And it rapidly spreads when the water is warm, nutrient rich and still. Uh, so there's quite a bit of azola actually down at uh, lower parts of the Werribee, in the Werribee area currently, but nowhere near as much as it was in 2015. Uh, we've had some decent flows this winter, so I doubt if it'll be a problem over summer, but who knows. So this particular photo was taken by myself one evening and we put it up on Facebook. We often change the Facebook uh, cover photo up the top. And uh, this was up there somewhere some time ago and a developer's pr uh, pub promoter got in touch with me and said, John, can we have this photo as a part of our promotion for a developer who's doing some work in one of your suburbs in wherever I asked then as a result, well, what are you going to do with it? And uh, would you give us any money for it? 
So they were happy to pay us $100 and that came back in a quick email reply. And I said, but please tell me what you're doing. And they didn't answer me. So a couple of days later, I asked again. And uh, the chap said, oh, well, he just wants to use it to promote his development and to sell his land. And uh, they were, by the way, close to the river further north. And then they didn't uh, tell me anything about the building development. So I persisted and kept asking, well, well what's your building development going to be like? Is it going to have decent design on the roads? Is it going to have litter uh, grids or grates on the stormwater pits on the side of the road? Are your houses going to be fairly sustainable? Are you planting native trees? Well, my answer must have been too much. Uh, sorry, my request must have been too much because about a week later, he'd not answered me. Oh, I wrote out a little email again and said, what's the update on this? And I got a reply about 15 minutes later and it said, oh, we decided to get photos off the, uh, the domain because um, we just didn't want to use your photos. And I think what happened there was the developer didn't want to tell us anything about their development. Uh, we're not worried about the $100, we're more worried about the fact that they wouldn't um, work with us or, or you know, contribute to what this presentation's been all about. The fact that we do need to protect these beautiful waterways and we do need other investors coming in and they don't have to give us squillions of dollars, they can just carry on their work, but they can do it in a more sustainable way, recognising the rights of nature and the needs of human beings. That's all they have to do but some people are going to be hard to convince to bring them on board. Now, uh, about our second last slide, I want to show you some of these convinced investors in Western waterways at our way. So right across the top, we've got some significant, significant others who work with us in active ways. So Waterkeeper Alliance is the international organisation to which we waterkeepers, that is, the Eco Centre at Port Phillip, they host the Port Phillip Bay Keeper. The Yarra River Keeper is hosted by the Yarra River, Yarra River Keepers Association. Uh, they work with me as colleagues, and the Environment Justice Australia worked with us as um, nature's environmental lawyers. And so we work together on a whole range of things. Um, Yarra, the Waterkeeper Alliance in the United States um, has got about 400 different waterkeepers across the world. You can have glacier keepers creek keepers, bay keepers, and so forth. Uh, so the great organisation, uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. is the um, lead of that whole organisation. He's been involved right from day one when they set up back in the 1960s on the, on the Hudson River in New York. Uh, he and a couple of other um, Worcester fishermen uh, took a company to court and uh, charged the company with um, ruining their oyster fishing um, industry in the Hudson River in New York and uh, they won and so the money from that court case went into convincing this Waterkeeper Alliance stuff or they didn't realise it was going to be an alliance in those days it was just funding a, a river keeper um, and water keeper over that way and then eventually it spread and it's now in uh, probably all major continents has quite a few in Asia quite a few in Africa now some in the Caribbean all the way through North America both in Canada and the US down in South America, into Europe and London. Uh, where else? I think I've just about covered everybody. And so uh, there would need to be more, of course, and we'd love someone on Maribyrnong. And so if you're out there listening and you're passionate and you think you've seen the work of the River Association and you know you're working hard anyway, uh, maybe you could join in, talk to some of these groups over your way, like Friends of Steel Creek or in the next line, Friends of... Uh, Lower Kuroi, make contact with them and, and uh, if you can't find my details, talk to them and they'll get you on to me. Um, also other groups we work with, uh, Friends of Skeleton Creek, just across the way into the east of Wyndham. Uh, we work with them quite a bit. Wombat Forest Care, they're up in the Central West Forest. We work with Gail and her colleagues up that way. ANGFA, who are the Australian New Guinea Fish Association, we've done quite a bit of research with them. Uh, Nature West, who are down here in Wyndham as well, working across uh, land care issues. Uh, Manavar Primary, Wyndham Central College, Karambalik College. So these are all schools we worked with on a long-term basis. Um, going across further, Cleaner Beaches, that's in the right in the middle of the slide. Uh, Cleaner Beaches, that's uh, the Aust Beach Patrol Australia's uh, logo. Then we have the Uniting Church who worked with us in Beach Patrol for a long time, Australia India Foundation. 
uh, set up, based up in Truganina, who work with us on beach patrol, uh, Hoppers Crossing Apex, two or three Rotary Clubs in Wyndham, so there's Werribee, Hoppers Crossing, Wyndham and more. And then now a newcomer to the scene is Bacchus Marsh Platypus Alliance up in Bacchus Marsh. So Jodie and her troops up there, I hope she's listening today. And uh, it's lovely to have them on board again, as it is with any of these groups. Uh, Wholesome, we work with. You saw how we do litter days and plannings with them. Toyota, I mentioned them. They actually gave us a small grant years ago to do a uniform, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, Western Water also helped us out in that regard, just jumping over Southern Rural Water. There. Southern Rural Water we work with on environmental flows and other issues. Uh, Victorian Environmental Water hold of the same environmental flows. DELP also, of course, down the bottom, Victoria State Government, well, lots of ways through Port Phillip Bay Fund, uh, through the Environmental Water hold of stuff as well. And finally, down the bottom, Parks Victoria, who we work with in some of our land care issues. I do our bird studies, some of our bird surveys on that. Uh, on their property and finally Wyndham City a great partner in many many things uh, down here in Wyndham and of course that's not to mention others we've worked with Mirable of course Mirable uh, Council obviously Melton over time but we just um, haven't done a lot with them so this list this picture is not indicative of everybody it's just of the ones that we're currently pr um, working on together now and um, uh, we're proud to have them on board uh, so that's all of us. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. And if you do want to contact us for any reason, there's lots of way to do that. Our general email is Werribee River at Gmail. Our uh, membership line is on membership at werribeeriver.org.au. So that's also a link or a mention of a website. The Riverkeeper myself is also at werribeeriver.org.au. That's my phone number next. Uh, we're, there's our link to our website there, www, etc. Then we have a Facebook link, which is quite an active page. And we're on Instagram there. And um, sorry, that's Twitter handle. And uh, we're on Instagram um, as well. So if you want to contact us, there's plenty of way to do so. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, particularly to Melbourne Water for allowing us to present in this way to uh, a wider audience and uh, we hope by your time today that you've learnt a lot you appreciate a lot more of our own work and you know some more things about us and if you're someone we haven't worked with before but the opportunity does arrive you're welcome to contact us we look forward to meeting with you and talking and uh, thank you very much for a presentation I only hope you've enjoyed it and I hope the uh, relative lack of questions to date has been that you've been mesmerised. That would be a great outcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Richard, I'll stop share now and uh, you can take over things. Uh, did you want to keep uh, this? Sorry, John, did you want to keep sharing this screen while we uh, just cover up the last couple of these questions? Uh, yeah, well, I'll leave the detail there if you like that current slide. Are you happy with that? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Um, right. And lots and lots of comments uh, from people just thanking you for your presentation today, John. So, um, yeah, have a check out the chat when you get a chance. Some very nice comments from uh, the people that are attending. Um, so we've got a couple of questions in the Q&A. Uh, so does the Weeby River Association have any clout in regard to the proposed toxic soil disposal at Banigaling Coal at Bacchus Marsh? Um, so I think you've had a bit of um, collaboration with the crew, with the Plutty, Plutty um, Bacchus Marsh Platypus um, Alliance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have no clout except, like any community, uh, you need to speak up. So if people want to say they don't want that thing up there, then they need to speak up. So we did speak up. We took part in a couple of rallies, one here in Werribee when it looked as if it might end up here. Um, we joined the local um, community group who were against that. Of course, they were also linked with the early original toxic dump um, refusal that ended up being just that, a refusal here in Wyndham years ago. Uh, then uh, I uh, did a, what is now up on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, a um, a talk to the Bax Marsh Rally and I attended, sorry, online rally, and then I attended there on the Green Rally up there in Bacchus Marsh. I assume that's what we're talking about here. And uh, certainly we don't believe that that soil should be out and about. And 
not only shouldn't it be out there physically and chemically for all those wrong reasons, but it also has not been, it has not lived up to, and this is the essence of what I said to the online rally in Bacchus Marsh, the state government and others and industry and the companies that are involved have not really lived up to their commitment to community consultation and asking community what they think and what are your values community and what do you love best and what do you want? They ask you all those things, they do all that lip service and they turn around and don't do anything. That's really the nature or the, or the guts of what I said to the community at Bacchus Marsh. So no, we have no clout, but we have a voice and that's what people should take as a lesson out of this um, talk today or out of their own belief. They really should stand up and speak up for their community. Thanks, John. Um, someone was asking about the status of the Waterways of the West plan um, and if it's been considered for funding or anything in that space that you could touch on. Yes, so it has now come through a discussion stage. There has been a list of recommendations. I have seen those recommendations. I don't think they're available to the public. I've not seen it. And I know I was asked at the time not to say anything about them. They're quite reasonable, very reasonable recommendations. It's now up to government to fund them and we're waiting. The recommendations from memory would have been out about six months, I'm going to say out, published by the team that put together the recommendations, traditional owners, the water authorities, or big pun, traditional owners and dealt really put it all together. But then uh, the recommendations were made and we were shared, the, the water keepers were shared with the, um, the recommendations, or rather we looked at the recommendations, but we certainly have nothing to say about what state government does. But the recommendations are good. They really will bring some great outcomes for the community and for the water authorities and so forth. Uh, but we only hope they're funded because if they're funded, they'll help Melbourne Water try and achieve the next to impossible task of uh, meeting all these challenges into the future. And uh, we're looking forward to it. And hopefully it's still on track to hear something by Christmas. Excellent. Um, and a comment here from Bruna. We are seeing a lot of great volunteer work around Melbourne enlightening some issues surrounding our nature. How can government support this and ensure current laws are enforced? Okay, so government uh, can live up to what it should be doing. So under the Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act, you saw that with my example on the platypus, it's all very well to list an animal, but then uh, people, uh, sorry, well, people get frustrated by the fact that the right amount of money doesn't ever go to the right place for the right reason. So you've seen issues like uh, the, the um, Leadbedder's possum, uh, the helmeted honey eater and so forth, um, there are big issues facing some of our threatened species. I think we've got something like 14% of our bird species, or is it 14% of our species in general, including birds and mammals, are threatened, but no, not much money is being spent on them. Not enough money. Some money is, obviously, but not enough money. So uh, things like the orange-bellied parrot, which exists in just a few cages and in a few birds' nests in Tasmania, uh, Werribee River here, Werribee River, Sorry, Werribee Open Range Zoo here look, has some um, orange-bellied parrots and so forth. So things like that don't get enough money spent on them. Uh, if we're ever going to keep these things, including platypus, in the rivers for our grandkids to enjoy and the subsequent generations, then we need to spend some more money. Um, but coronavirus is going to stop and slow a few things down, of course, so we have to be patient with government over that. But this is where the opportunities arise for those companies who uh, survive through times like this and uh, make profits. It's a, an opportunity for foundations and uh, philanthropics. It's a time for uh, some independent funding of these issues to keep Australia's unique nature just there exactly because it's going to be there forever, we hope. And it, could, it, it, it underpins our tourism, it underpins local economies, it underpins employment and people who stand up and talk about jobs and growth have to realise that Mother Nature gives them the very resources that they make a profit out of. And it's time that some of the companies and uh, the governments and so forth actually put back into Mother Nature some of the things that we've taken out of it over time. Uh, so I, I think that's probably answered that one, Richard. Thanks, John. 
Uh, we also had a question about the monitoring project of heavy metals and Skeleton Creek and the Weirby River. Um, so I've posted a few links to your website for the Bridging Troubled Waters project and also Bio2 Labs um, uh, webpage on that. Uh, so you can check out those links and we did have Bio2 Lab talk about that in one of our previous webinars. Um, so we should hopefully have that video up online as soon as we're allowed to post on social media again. But did you um, have anything that you wanted to touch on to that, John, just quickly? Well, I think I actually have all the logos that were on the screen. I probably didn't mention Dave Shaley uh, and, and Bio2 Lab for his great uh, presentation a couple of weeks ago, which I was there for. Um, but that was a great project. Uh, Teresa McIntosh, of course, was involved in that. Um, some great work done, and we've worked with EPA as a result of that. Uh, for those who don't know, um, Dave, I think, I can't remember if he said it or not, but uh, we discovered in one particular area on the Werribee that we do have some heavy metals, um, not at significantly dangerous uh, levels, but we do have them coming from certain sites. And one particular site uh, was um, had a door knock on one day from our, our Teresa and uh, the, the Opel officer who was helping, who was the EPA representative here in Werribee. And they went in and talked to these people and these people didn't realise what they were doing, just a practice of cleaning up from their um, small industry. And they actually, these people did go and uh, do something, cleaned up, put some bunding around um, and controlled their uh, wastes and so forth a lot better. Um, and then the next step was to go back to that company and uh, see if it was working or not. And in particular, it was still not working properly. It was not doing things properly. And so the Opal officer was able to issue them with a warning that if she returned on a third occasion, she would carry out some uh, penalty works. But um, as I understand it, nothing happened and they fixed up their game. So, so that was a good little outcome of that process. So yes, we found some things that are not good in both the Skeleton Creek uh, area around Heath Road and down in Werribee near the Boltley Bypass. Um, but uh, we haven't got any further with that, but it's our intention to carry on with that at all. And that Bridging Troubled Waters presentation and the project were great initiatives. Excellent. And we've just had a bit of a question in the chat about um, if there's a Friends of for Lollipop Creek anymore, or if it's been subdued um, under the Weber River Association. Okay, so this actually is a good intro to mention that these local groups often will live and die. Uh, we tried to start a Friends of Lollipop group back in about the 1990s, but it failed through lack of interest. So we just didn't even get to an incorporation stage. Uh, then it sort of floated along for a while in the early 2000s, and it seems to have died out. But maybe it's time to start it again. Uh, perhaps if we had some significant people out that way who maybe join perhaps Love Our Street 3024, which is out their way, and we could use Love Our Street 3024 as a nucleus for Friends of Lollipop Creek. Uh, we're looking at a grant application uh, currently into the future uh, with regard to some works out on Lollipop Creek and some nature activities. Um, so that may be something these people could work with. But in order to get a Friends of group going, we definitely need the people and uh, we can't do it without them. Uh, there's certainly enough people out that way now. Manor Lakes and Wyndham Vale both have Lollipop Creek going through them. There's some beautiful sites there and it's a really pretty spot. And um, originally before Mel Water came out the way, there was a developer who uh, changed the stream from a little ephemeral shallow channel along which some lovely river red gums were growing. They dug it out, opened it up and flooded it permanently as a small lake and they killed off about it half a dozen river, massive, beautiful old river red gums. But that was way back in the early, uh, late 90s, early 2000s. And since then, of course, under Melbourne Waters uh, rain, things have improved out there. But a community group is always a wonderful thing to have. And there must be six groups who in my time in the Wyndham area have lived for a while and died. So there's friends of Werribee South existed, wonderful people. But like all of us, they got old and there were no young bloods coming in. But Wyndham, Varna, Mel and, and Manor Lakes have a wonderful opportunity. There's a lot of people out that way, um, people who might have time and could simply devote the Friends of, Lolli Friends of Lollipop Creek under, say, the banner of Love Our Street, and they could, in fact, do litter work. 
and then we might have a planting project. I'll, I'll mention Love Our Street 3030 and Lisa Field, who, um, as well as cleaning up, Lisa did some planting projects at the Werribee Railway Station. So the Love Our Street group can be a multi a purpose group, it just, just does not have to do little work. And it could also be the nucleus of the Friends of Lollipop Creek. So look, I know that's a long answer, Richard, but it's a bit of a story and it could be their own story at Lollipop Creek Way if they want it. They can get in touch with us and we'll talk to them. Excellent. Thanks for that. Um, and yeah, so for anyone that is curious about getting involved in any of these kind of activities or wanting to start up your own stuff, if you're in the West, uh, the contact details that are up on screen at the moment is a fantastic starting point for that. Um, you can chat to the Weber River Association, um, whether there's activities you could join on board for them or even just getting a bit of advice. Um, I've noticed that Gillian in the chat has been talking about um, the Love Our Street program. So if you're not in this West area, but your other areas around Melbourne, um, that is another great organization to, to check out. And um, that could be an opportunity to do some cool activities in your space. Um, along with Beach Patrol is another great organization that Love Our Street is um, partnered with, I believe. Uh, and there's also, yeah. I'll plug the um, the environmental volunteering uh, webpage that's being run by DELP. There's a great interactive map there. If you wanted to check out for local environment groups that are in your area, there is a really cool map there. That you can just sort of see who's active in your area and contact details, details for that. Richard, could I come back in there? I actually forgot to mention Jodie's group. I think Bacchus Marsh Platypus Alliance. I mean, I know that's a group, but I just, I think I forgot to, in one of the questions you asked me before, I need to talk about, I could, you asked me to mention Jody or some such comment. Um, I just wanted to mention Jody's group up there in Bacchus Marsh. They have been doing a whole lot of, as their name tells you, platypus work. They're, they're listing all the known sightings of platypus over time. They've looked at all the known, and there aren't many up that way, uh, there aren't many data observations because there hasn't been a lot of research but they're building up on that they're also doing a lot of work on litter with us as a partnership and recently we ran a beautiful platypus competition poster competition which centered around litter so you can see that litter can be a great inroad to doing all sorts of good work in the environment um, because there's a hell of a lot of litter out there currently. In fact, probably that arrow on the downward trend, I did all that line I did in the downward trend to probably get down below zero on some parts at the moment. But um, Jody and her group in Bacchus Marsh would certainly like some help if people are up that way and want to join in. Uh, she'd appreciate that. But I, I don't think I mentioned it before, so I thought I'd better give her credit where credit's due now. Thanks for that. And we do have Bob from the um, Bacchus Marsh Putty Alliance that's just chipped into the chat as well. So if you are interested in that, we do have a few people in the chat if you wanted to check in with them. Um, yeah, and one of, the, one of the comments that was coming from uh, the local that was asking about Lollipop Creek was um, just how some of these issues can be huge or overwhelming. So um, looking for something local, tangible and collaborative um, is, yeah, one of the best ways to get into that. Um, I might just mention that, like, I don't think I've seen a better period than now in terms of uh, this opportunity for groups and um, to be able to get in contact with each other and to actually connect. I've never seen this, this kind of level of connection that we have since we've been in the COVID lockdown. So if you are looking to make those kind of connections, now actually seems to be a really good time for that to happen, which is surprising, yeah, I think, yeah. considering the situation. And if I could come in again uh, there, um, it's impossible to do group work at the moment, obviously. So if you'd like to contact also our Love Our Street 3030 champion, Lisa Field, she's running a connection exercise currently called, please help me, Lisa, love, love Your Patch. Sorry, I couldn't get the word out. Um, we had a meeting yesterday and there's a, there's a, there are good things you can do individually and you can still send your data in to us via our litter, well, the Love Our Street and the Beach Patrol uh, litter stopper app. If you're just walking in your five kilometre zone and you pick up a few things in a plastic bag yourself, uh, pick, use gloves, pick up the stuff, um, record that on the Little Watch app and send the data in, uh, that helps um, a whole lot of data, helps keep a whole lot of pressure on a whole lot of um, politicians and so on who need to make decisions. It's not so much the pressure, but it's really good data to help them make reasonable decisions. That's really what I mean by that. And in fact, I'll just mention also the Werribee River Association is contributing currently along with Melbourne Water to uh, a new uh, database uh, created by the Department of Environment called Litter Watch. Uh, so 
all of this data is useful, not only for us locally, for amenity and whatever, but it's also good for government because we're actually helping them to have the confidence to make decisions and spend money on what will give our kids and our grandkids a better future. Excellent. Um, thanks, John. I think we've uh, hit the end of our questions and those comments. Yes. So I think we might leave it there. So thanks very much for your time today. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll stop the share. Thank you. So, um, yeah, look, thank you very much, John. Uh, that has been a fantastic presentation for today. And um, I'd like to thank everyone for jumping on board and um, participating in this um, presentation and for all the fantastic questions and the, uh, the conversation that's been happened within the chat as well. So, um, yes, excellent. Uh, we will, we've recorded this. This will be going up online um, as soon as we can. Um, and, um, yes, we do have a couple more sessions that are coming up in the next uh, fortnight. Uh, so if you wanted to check out our Expert Connections page on the Melbourne Water website, you can check out for more of those upcoming sessions and registrations and all the other details for that as well. So, yep, thank you very much. Thank you, John. And um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Richard. Thank you all.